These are the public faces of Franklin and Sir Francis. But privately, they shared other interests too. Within sight of the manor house, a gothic entryway to what many believe was a sexual netherworld, the Hellfire Caves. This is rumored to be the meeting place for Ben Franklin and other elite members of Sir Francis's Hellfire Club. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Dead Shell Talk. This is going to be episode two, where we're going to dive into probably one of the most mysterious and occult fraternal lodges slash gatherings in history. We're going to be talking about the Hellfire Club, which is a English Irish lodge established in the 18th century. And what we're going to be talking about is the occultism, the satanic ritualism, human sacrifice, and some of the philosophical and ideological beliefs that this group had. So the Hellfire Club was founded in 1719 by the first Duke of Wharton. His name was Philip. And it was essentially an ensemble of, how do you say, like the richest men of Brit well, Britain, United Kingdom. So to include Ireland, and they were determined to like push the boundaries of society in a what's the word I'm looking for, Brian? Like debauchery. What, what, what we're looking at here is basically uh, occultism, maybe even Satanism. It's this might be like the first account of what people might see as the occult is is in worshiping things that are against mainstream religion is what we're looking at. But it's it's important to note out here that the original Hellfire Club, like you said, was formed by the Duke of Wharton. And it's not to be confused with the Hellfire Club that's kind of infamous in the one that we're talking about today that was formed by Sir Francis Dashwood. So the Duke of Wharton, he was made a Duke by George I. He was actually a very prominent politician, um, kind of a man of character and also a man of debauchery. And it was said that he actually lived two separate lives. Um, the first being that a man of letters and the second kind of a drunkard, a rioter, an infidel, if you will, is kind of the reputation that he earned for himself. But anyway, what he did is he decided to join or form this uh, fraternity, if you will. And it started out as a gentleman's club, a dinner club where people could talk about things that were of interest to him, including poetry, philosophy, politics. Um, it's kind of where these elite individuals would come and have dinner twice a month to discuss kind of the goings on, you know, and it was a gentleman's club. Um, but within that gentleman's club, you know, they were, they were obviously drinking large amounts of alcohol. They were doing things like ridiculing religion, kind of going against the status quo. Um, people who were very high up in society. Um, and in this, there was this thing going on, this trend in England, because at the time, um, the King uh, King George I was kind of, his power was waning. So people were in this kind of rebellion mindset, if you will. Um, so within this gentleman's club, you know, they were mocking kind of religion, blaspheming in a way by like drinking too much. And it was all kind of a shock to the outside world that these like elite individuals um, within the class system of the England or UK, if you will, um, were forming this kind of gentleman's club and doing this thing. And it, in the dinners that they had, you know, it kind of grew to this point where they were mocking religious ceremonies so much that the, the dinners that they were eating, um, they were a thing called the Holy Ghost pie, um, the breast of Venus, the devil's loin, the thing that they drank was called the hellfire punch. Hmm. And and this Duke of Wharton's club, the original Hellfire Club, as it was uh, deemed, it, it came to an end in 1721. I believe he formed it in 1718. It, it was very, very, very short-lived. Um, the the kind of occultism and the Satanism and all the weird like orgies, sacrifices, worshiping the devil, all this crazy stuff was came from Sir Francis Dashwood. Um, this is the club that he formed, and this is the club that kind of grew into this what it is today and what we understand when we say the hellfire club and we think about what it is. Yeah. Um, with the secrecy that usually surrounds like fraternal lodges and stuff like rumors typically start to 
gets spread throughout the town like oh so and so is doing this and what are they doing up at this uh, abbey i can't remember what was the name of the abbey do you have it off it was wed wedmanheiser uh, what was it called i'll have to uh i know there was medmanham abbey medmanham that was the one that was the original uh mm. that was the original location of the uh first hellfire club which i think is particular that the continuation of religious sanctums was the choice location of this especially sir dashwoods or um his his location he continued into abbeys and they had like these tunnels that underneath like the hellfire they call it the hellfire caves so like underneath the abbeys uh, I don't know if it was like originally constructed like that or if they added these caves, but there's staircases that goes underneath the ground. So absolutely no, nobody knew what was going on. That's why all these oh. rumors would uh, surface. Um, one thing I did want to touch on regarding like the, um, cause I think Dashwood's version of the Hellfire Club is the most interesting, like the original philosophy of the Hellfire Club initially was, you know, they advocated for rationality, liberty, skepticism of traditional instructions and morality. Um, you know, they they were talking about like normal things back then, like, oh, like enlightenment mm -hmm. and spiritual journeys and all these things. That's not too uh, taboo for the times. But what I found interesting when I was reading is that with the demonic dealings and worship that was going on in Dashwood's version was that they were so involved in satanic practices and satanic ritualism that they literally would leave a seat open for the devil at their meetings. Like that's recorded through a uh, historian recorded that uh, in their excerpts from the Hellfire Club is that they would purposely leave this seat open in case the devil wanted to come down and sit. And where that story comes from is that uh, one night that they were they were drinking a lot, doing, <clears throat> doing their orgies, all that crazy stuff that they were doing. And, and there was a table where they were playing cards and one player dropped a card underneath the table and he, when he bent down to pick it up, he noticed that a fellow player or the person sitting across from him had a, had a cow's foot. And um, when he looked back up, the hoofed man disappeared. Uh, now, I don't know. That's, that's insane. <laughs> what, it, what's interesting is that I don't know if that's like a true story because there's a very similar story associated with a manor in um, Ireland. Um, I can't remember. Oh gosh, what's the name of that manor? But anyways, so basically, the the story of that manor is that the devil sailed into the bay one night and um, came in to stay the night because there was a storm and they were playing cards in this manor in Dublin and like they dropped the card and they looked underneath the table and to see that this man had hooves and then he like flies to the ceiling and disappears. So I don't know if that's just like a tall tale or what, but still, we we know that they were drinking to excess, right? Maybe. <laughs> They were just the drunk hallucinations per se. And, but I mean, uh, in every kind of legend or myth, right? There's some level of truth, but it's kind of the telephone game over years, right? So who knows what actually happened? Yeah, uh, and I know particularly from when Ghost Adventures investigated the, uh, that was Dashford's, um, well, no, it wasn't Dashford's. It was, a, it was the one in Dublin on top of the hill there. It's like this abbey on top of the hill. Um, and they were talking to somebody that was involved in the Hellfire Club or had family members involved with the Hellfire Club to where that they were telling a story about how they were doing like human sacrifice in the basement of this abbey in these Hellfire caves. And they were particularly sacrificed like small people, people with um, like, what's the word, like deformed individuals, mentally challenged mm. individuals. Um, so yeah, they were definitely doing some nasty stuff down there. And we can only imagine that acts like this leave such a crazy gateway open. Like you could think like a direct link to hell, uh, which I think is, you know, no pun intended with the name of the Hellfire Club. But um, what do you think? We should probably talk about the characters associated with the Hellfire Club. I uh, know we talked about Dashford, we talked about uh, Duke of Wharton, but we can dive a little bit more into that so we can kind of set the stage. So I know we, there were many individuals, there's an untold number of individuals who were part of the Hellfire Club. I believe historians and kind of the legend goes, there was an original 12, obviously Sir Francis Dashwood was one of them. And what he did is he formed this club, a place called the George and Vulture Inn, and that was throughout the 1730s. Uh, when he founded this, it was called the Order of Knights of St. Francis. 
and that was deemed in 1746. And the creed or the motto that he created for the Hellfire Club was, do what thou wilt. And this was a philosophy of life associated with Francois, Francois, never mind, I don't even know how to say that name. Anyway, so do what thou wilt. What's really interesting is this was later adopted by Aleister Crowley, which Aleister Crowley is kind of the person who in the early 1900s redefined occultism and kind of what we understand is this really scary, really weird order of rituals and demonic forces that he called a system of telema. And it's really interesting how he kind of played off of Sir Francis Dashwood. So really what we're looking at in the Hellfire Club is kind of the first formulation and the first known like kind of nef nefarious or infamous club, if you will, that did not ha have a good reputation. They were going against the status quo. And to talk about Sir Francis Dashwood just a little bit, um, he was really no well known for his pranks. Um, you know, being a very high member of society himself as well, he was in the royal court in St. Petersburg in Russia. And at the time he dressed up as the King of Sweden, which at that time, Sweden and Russia, they were great enemies. So for him to kind of have the gall to walk in there and play this prank on, you know, a, a state that's at war with another, it kind of shows his level of just not giving a, a heck, if I guess you could say. But anyway, it started with 12 people, but it originally increased. Of the original 12, um, some of these individuals are regularly identified throughout history. So we started with Sir Francis Dashwood. Then there was Robert Vanistart, Thomas Potter, Francis Duffield, Edward Thompson, Paul Whitehead, John Montague, who was the fourth Earl of Sandwich. And this list of supposed members is absolutely immense, along with more pro uh, probable candidates like Benjamin Bates, George Bubb Doddington. Uh, he was a famed like, copulate man uh, in his 60s at the time when he joined the club. There's William Hogarth, which I'm naming off all these people. You can look them up in their kind of biographies and what they did. They were all prominent members of society. And what's really interesting is uh, Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, that one's known. That one threw me off. I was like, okay, so you have this uh, prominent member of like American history that goes over to England for the first time he was over in England, he gets introduced to the Hellfire Club. And it just makes me think like, this is the 18th century. So what 1700s, right? So you <clears throat> going all the way back into the 1700s, I don't know, it goes back further than that. But you have these secret societies of like extremely powerful individuals. Uh, and I don't know if necessarily if Benjamin Franklin could be considered an extremely powerful individual. But it's these names that like a name that pops up, you're like, holy crap. Okay. So like, what was, you know, you think of Benjamin Franklin as like, oh, the guy that, you know, tied the flow the kite and got electrocuted. And, you know, like on the hundred dollar, huh? He's on our money. Yep. Yeah. He's, he's on our money. He's on our money. And like <laughs> Illuminati, he was, yeah. Like he was having orgies potentially and worshiping the devil and doing all these things with these influential politicians and noblemen in Europe just kind of makes you scratch your head. Like what has carried forward through history with like elites and politicians. And, you know, you can look at like the Epstein stuff and yada, yada, yada. It just like, it, it seeps back so far. And I just think it's like a cultural uh, world, cultural elite ideology to participate in these like secret groups. And it's just strange. Do you, to me. Do you think that's what's going on in today's society? Well, we just don't know the name of whatever, you know, these political figures, we don't know the name of their club. Well, yeah, I mean, like uh, you can imagine back in now we have, you know, obviously, you know, the internet and, you know, telephoto, tele, telephoto cameras and camcorders and whatever, cell phones that can record all these things. But there's places that we aren't, we, the public don't get into like the Bohemian Grove, right? So like the Bohemian Grove is a meeting place in California where all the world's elites, like presidents have been there, world presidents, uh, business moguls, all these things they get together in this weird forest in, in California with a giant owl and they drink and they, who knows what they do inside there. Cause no one giant, can... giant owl. Yeah. So there's like this giant oh. owl carving 
that they have set up in the middle of the Bohemian Grove. And there's a bunch of tables laid out and they all sit there and they drink and they talk. And apparently like the, the conspiracy is, is that they like make world decisions and stuff like that at this meeting once a year and while they're intoxicated. And it's, it's, you know, it's like, it's like stuff like that stems from stuff like this. I don't know. Maybe they are doing occult ritualism out there because there's a, I think it was Alex Jones snuck into the Bohemian Grove and took pictures. That's where you find the pictures of the owl and like the people that have like robes on and there's torches burning and like, you know, your imagination can take you so far to say, okay, what are these people doing? You know, who knows, but maybe what is, what if it is, you know, satanic ritualism or occult ritualism, Aleister Crowley type stuff with like Egyptian based like deities and gods and goddesses like I don't know. That's uh, it. Really makes you think, doesn't it? I could be going on today. I mean, uh, there's so many cults that are around today, and uh, what makes the world go around? It's almost like uh, they took influence from what's going on way back when, and I guess humanity never really changes as time goes on. Yeah. But you mentioned you mentioned deities, and I, I don't want to lose my train of thought. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about how the Hellfire Club kind of got its reputation as being a cult like or worshiping the devil um, throughout history, um, you know, within their abbey that they kind of refurbished. Um, according to a man named Horace Walpole, the members practice was religiously pagan in nature, hmm. uh, worshiping people like Bacchus, I might have slaughtered that pronunciation, but he was a Greek god and also Venus. Uh, I want to talk briefly about both of these gods here. And actually, uh, so so Bacchus is also known as uh, Dionysus or Dionysus, okay. uh, the Greek god. Yeah, uh, and they were these are Roman, right? Uh, Bacchus and Venus. That's Roman, and then you're listing off Greek, correct? This is the the ancient Greek religion. Okay. And th throughout that, um, so Bacchus, Dionysus, is the god of winemaking, orchards and fruit, vegetation, fertility festivity, insanity, ritual madness, ritual ecstasy, which I thought was really weird. And I actually looked into a little bit about what religious ecstasy is, because that religious and ecstasy don't really seem <laughs> those two yeah, terms yeah. kind of juxtapose each other. So I was like, what, what the heck is going on here? So apparently religious ecstasy is a type of altered state of consciousness, and it's characterized greatly by reduced external awareness and reportedly expanded interior mental and spiritual awareness, frequently accompanied by visions and emotional and sometimes physical euphoria or phenomenon. Hmm. It's usually experienced in brief times, um, but I, it, that really stuck out to me because what they're describing is basically um, um, from yoga. Like yoga isn't something where you contort your body and you know you you become really fit and flexible right yoga as it was traditionally meant was a was a practice where you're trying to achieve a state of ecstasy called samadhi and within samadhi you you i guess you would essentially achieve religious ecstasy where your external awareness is gone your inter internal awareness is awakened and you received you download like divine knowledge from the environment from the universe from from deities which is maybe what these people were doing um uh you know they they drank to excess they're worshiping a god that is literally like the god of winemaking right and then also uh, venus venus is a roman goddess right whose function encompasses love beauty desire sex fertility prosperity and victory so they're worshiping these these old gods you know that uh, of course you know the church and the, and the king are not going to support with so they're going to become infamous and nefarious regardless of what they're doing because they're going against the status quo right so they're worshiping these old gods um, that's where this occultism kind of comes into play and we know that they drank to excess we know or the least the legend says we think we know right yeah, yeah. that they they performed uh orgies and drank to excess um throughout these festivals it was kind of this formation of a of a club at first but now now it's like a new church and they have these statues of these gods like all around when they do their meetings and they commune, right? And I think people started to catch on that uh, maybe they're not just meeting for dinner. Maybe they're up to no good. Maybe they're worshiping the devil. You know? 
Well, yeah, yeah. When you when you when you said the word religious ecstasy, I mean, because religious is a duality, right? So you have you have light and and dark, right? So if they were you know sacrificing people and doing occult rituals and in uh, X, Y, and Z, I mean, with the with the phraseology of religious ecstasy, like what are we talking about? Like the incantation of like succubi and incubi, like you know, like bringing forth these like demonic creatures into this environment to. Well, the Greek word daemon means uh, a characteristic trait. So, you know, if you really think about in the in the scope of religion, there's good, there's there's obviously good and evil. There's different characteristics that we all have within ourselves. We have good characteristics. We have bad characteristics. It's like, what do we choose to capitalize on? Um, you know, we have we have wants. We have desires. We we thirst for knowledge, right? We we do all these things and and. The Greek word daemon wasn't originally what the Catholic Church and Christianity originally, you know, it became demon, right? It's a yeah. it's it's a fallen angel, it's it's evil, it's bad. Yeah. Where the Greeks to them, those were their gods, right? But all of a sudden these daemons are now demons and now they're evil because we all kind of unified with uh, monotheistic um, concepts and practices, and the world kind of changed. So we rejected polytheism. And monotheism was, you know, Christ came onto earth and everything like that. So the world changed, right? So to go back on that and kind of rebel against the status quo, I mean, it caught him a lot of flack. And I think that's what eventually led to the ultimate decline of of the club overall, because it, it didn't last forever. Yeah. And uh, with the what you're just saying, I wanted to, I, I found something mm -hmm. interesting about the, um like individuals in the club, like you're talking about light base, dark base, you know, um, characteristics of ourselves, so, so on and so forth. There's a guy named uh, Simon Luttrell. Uh, we forgot to mention him. So he was the sheriff of Dublin City. So this is the same uh, location as where the, the Hellfire location was for on Ghost Adventures. Um, okay. I mean, you had people that in this club that were legitimately selling their soul to the devil. Like it, it said, people whispered that the devil had come to collect on this debt, leading to more rumors and conjecture. Um, so you had people that were literally like known through society and in the area for selling their soul to the, Oh, he, uh, uh, this, this sheriff. And think about that for a second. Like the sheriff of your town is known to be associated with the, the hellfire club. And you believe, or the townspeople believe that he legitimately sold his soul to the devil. Like it, we're all in good hands. <laughs> it's just a wild concept to me that this this was like an actual like like because we know in the world that there are groups of satanic worshipers and, and whatever each your own right. I mean I don't I don't think it's a good idea personally um, because I think that that stuff's very real. Like if you watch the last uh, podcast that we had with uh, Father Francis Amort, um, the Pope's exorcist, you know that first clip intro, like that doesn't seem like a whole lot of fun to me. And like if you're dabbling with the devil and you know you don't uh, give up your end of the bargain, like he's coming for you. So I don't know. It's just all, it's just wild to think about. You know, sacrifices and it's just it's so uncanny for like 17th century or 18th century behavior. It just doesn't make any sense. Like I, I don't know. Well, and I, I think. You know, obviously, the the myth, the legend says, you know, satanic devil worshiping, sacrifices, orgies, drinking to excess, gambling. Um, what what kind of like you were saying about that? What was the club in California? The club in California. Yeah, you were talking about a different kind of cult where they drink under the owl. What was that called? Oh, oh the Bohemian Grove. What what really what really uh, caught my attention is like they wear robes. They, so it's like they're you obviously think they're wearing robes, like they're magicians, they're cults. They're, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So what's interesting is the Hellfire Club, they wore ritual clothing as well. So I don't think this helped their reputation either. And what, their ritual, the ritual, go ahead. Uh, well, the, with the clothing, one thing that I, uh, when we were talking about the, um, the, the sex stuff that they did, uh, the blasphemous, is that they would actually dress up as priests and nuns and just perform and like, and just, everything just entirely sacrilegious that you can think of they were they were doing so they would they would come to these meetings and like priest uh garb and the nun garbs and then they would have orgies like it's just like a a, a melting pot of just like negative energy like i can't imagine like 
I'm a little scatterbrained, like thinking about like the the scale of the fact that you have people that were legitimately responsible for society that were just partaking and just like seeping themselves in this negativity and opening themselves up for interactions with demonic spirits and evil spirits and just tainting themselves. And no wonder, no wonder, like, you know, times back then were so crazy is because they were, they were doing crap like this. Well, it's really interesting you say that because, um, Aleister Crowley, you know, I kind of read about his life and kind of what he, he thought, his train of thought, his philosophy, the way he practiced his, his cult, right? The way he formed his own church, this religious ecstasy, right? I'm going back to that just because I think it's so fascinating. His take on it was to sexually, to have a group of people and a priest all commune and sexually please one individual, but not let them achieve orgasm. And they would do this to the point where they would start to have visions. They would start to basically have so much like sexual pleasure that they would achieve this samadhi like state, this uh, heightened consciousness. And the way that they achieved it was by doing the exact opposite, kind of what, what the Bible tells you to do, you know, priests and everything like that. It's like, if you have to, if you have to marry, marry, so you don't burn with passion. Right. Mm. So they did, let's just do the exact opposite. Let's just all have sex as much as we can. And we'll achieve this heightened state of enlightenment. Right. And to me, that's just so, it's so backwards and it's so shocking. Right. And I think that's why, you know, these people have long and gone, we're talking hundreds of years ago. Right. And we still, we're still talking about them today because what they did was just so radical. It was so against the status quo and kind of what you were talking about with the nuns and dressing up as priests and performing orgies and doing all that stuff, it, it, what that became known as, and that was in the 1500s, I believe it was in something known as a black mass, um, that sounds which familiar. is the witch's Sabbath, if you will. Okay. And the first complete depiction of this blasphemy of this black mass um, is in connection with the witch's Sabbath um, in a 1597 French work, The Antichrist. Um, and this was coming out during the Catholic time. The Protestants were kind of criticizing the Catholic Church, saying the devil is inside the Catholic Church and you should not follow Catholicism because of this reason. Um, so, you know, Catholicism was kind of publishing these things about the devil, like, we're the Catholic Church. We understand the devil. You don't. Kind of thing. So these different sects of of faith, uh, belief in Christ, they're, it, they're kind of going to war with each other, and that's how this whole which is Sabbath Black Mass. I, it's terrible to talk about. Really, it's it's a, it's. A, but these are satanic practices, and they were they became prevalent in the world at that time, around f the 1500s, 1600s. Um, and in that book, there's an account. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. So bear with me of what these black masses look like. And this is and just to just paint a picture of like, you know, what would be going on in the, the, the caves of the Hellfire Club, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. We can picture something like that. And on such nights, the devil comes to mass, to which end his servants set up an altar with black and ugly altar clothes under a docile of old black and torn cloth, and an altarpiece with images and figures of the devil. Before mass begins, they have a missal ready and all the other things needed for saying it. And the devil hears the confessions of all his witches who admit as sins, the times they have been to church, the masses they have heard, the good deeds they have done and the evil deeds they have failed to do. Once they have all confessed to the devil, he dresses in certain long black and ugly vestments as he begins his mass, his servants singing with him low and out of tune voices in a certain part of it, he preaches a sermon to them in which he tells them not to be vainglorious in searching for a God other than the one that they have, for he is a good God. And that though in this life, they must endure hardship, work and poverty and the next they will enjoy much rest. And then they go down on their knees in the presence of the devil and kiss him on his left hand and chest and shameful parts underneath his tail. And once they have all made this offering and veneration, the devil continues his mass and lifts up a round thing. This round thing of the size of a host, which is black like the sole of a shoe on which an image of the devil is painted. And as he lifts it, he says, this is my body. And while they are all on their knees, beating themselves on their chest in veneration, they say, I cannot pronounce this, but the, 
the Latin translation is he goat up, he goat down. And in the same way, he lifts up this sort of chalice, seemingly a black wood. And once the mass is ended, he gives them communion, which while they are on their knees around him and giving each of them a sort of black shape on which there is an image of the devil, which is very sharp to swallow. And he gives them a drought of a very bitter drink, which notably, noticeably chills their hearts. Okay, so that's that was the cath. Go ahead, go that, ahead. That sounds to me like the Antichrist version of a communion. So basically, he, uh, so like the 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 embodiment of Christ, right? It's like the like the wafer, like the embodiment of the devil, but it's sharp and it's hard to swallow. And instead of a a wine which is pleasant to drink, it's bitter and awful to drink. So it's like the complete polar opposite of like a communion. Um, but as you you said, as it he go up it go. Goat up, he goat, goat like the animal. Yeah, he goat up, yep. he goat down. It's it translates to me as above, so below. Uh, that's <laughs> something that's pretty heavy in a lot of occultism and different beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, uh, here's my this thing. Kind of go ahead. Yeah, here's my thing about that. That is that is so like descriptively written though. Like, is that is that book like the Antichrist? Like, is that written like off of like a count of like testimonial of someone who like participated? You said 1598, right? I need to go back and reference my notes. So I want to make sure I quote this correctly. Um, so this is where these were academics. Uh, the academic that's quoting this is Emma Wilby. Okay. That, that the emphasis on the black mass in these trials evolved out of a particularly creative interaction between interrogators keen on finding evidence of the right and a Basque peasantry who were deeply committed to a wide range of unorthodox religious practices, so like the, such as black masses. So like the religion police, basically, like the Salem witch trial-esque, like uh, witch hunter type things. Which, you know... I mean, throughout time and, you know, the 200 years later, we have the Hellfire Club and they're performing something very similar to this. And that's the thing that you look back on throughout history is that uh, when people say that like occultism or like spiritualistic uh, rituals and stuff are a bunch of nonsense. But if you look back and like kind of look at like what they were doing then and what they're doing now. So that was 200 years prior and then 200 years later, like they take influences from each other and it makes you kind of scratch your head to think like, okay, like what is legitimately true? Does this actually work? Just like when we were at Hill House and we opened up the Lesser Key of Solomon and we read just a little excerpt of it, right? This is that's a 16th century grimoire, and we opened it up and we read it and we got a response. Like, and mm -hmm. if you would ask 99% of people, they say, "Oh, well, that's just a bunch of crap. It's just a book. It's just a story." And we found out the hard way that you know maybe uh, it's not so much just a story. It might be something legitimate associated with that. Um, and you know and. The, the lesser key of Solomon could be a telephone game of, you know, it could be an allegory. It could be a high fantasy fiction novel, but I mean, you put it to the test and then we get results. When, when you were, when you were reading that black mass, dude, I had like chills. I don't know. Um, it, I'll be honest with you. I did too. I'm actually going to apply holy water after this. I felt like a warm tingly, like on my thighs, dude, it was bizarre. It, it didn't feel, uh, righteous to read i'll tell you that much no no um, no uh, i'm definitely gonna go and uh protect myself after this because i felt uh it's really weird that you say that uh, i've kind of felt weird reading it too the things that we do for y'all um <laughs> the, i felt uh, weird i felt weird before i wanted to read it remember i was like uh, it's kind of hard to talk about because i've read texts before and i've felt certain ways or i've seen certain things and uh, somehow the word, right? Like even in the Bible, like how did God create the universe? He, he breathed it into existence, right? His vibration created the universe. Something about speaking ritualistic things or ritualistic texts or historical texts. I don't know what it is. It's really interesting. Yeah, but I'm looking at my timer over here. We're rolling up on 34 minutes. So we'll go ahead and wrap this up. So basically we just wanted to kind of open up. Uh, there, so with... Topics like this, they're really interesting. There's really like bizarre things that have gone on in this life that we want to talk about here on this little podcast that we have going on. But sometimes there's just not a whole lot that, that that's available. These these things were so secret. Um, and what's Sir Francis Dashwood actually burned all of the records of the Hellfire Club, or so he thought. There was still some that survived. 
but he, he burned all of these records. And that's what a lot of these societies uh, did either that they're so tight lipped, like the Freemasons or the, like the odd fellows uh, lodge, or you can go down the, go down the list uh, uh, Respucians, um that are so tight lipped that nobody knows about it or that these records were destroyed. So there's really not a whole lot that you can go like factually. So we just wanted to kind of have an open forum discussion about this kind of interaction and you know, what went on there it's just all very interesting so leave a leave us a comment you know if you got you got some commentary you, you thought something was interesting or you want to expand on something i mean me and dylan uh we found each other and we wanted to talk about this stuff right because you can't bounce this stuff back and forth with a lot of people it's it's blasphemous they think you're weird right so leave us a comment to let us know what you think uh, we're going to talk about alistair crowley and the cult that he formed in the 1900s on the dead shell talk episode three Yep, and he has directly took influence from this episode here from the Hellfire Club, so it should be interesting. So we did really well last video. We got like 10 subscribers already from the uh, Pope's Exorcist, so that's freaking awesome. So obviously y'all enjoy this, so please keep them coming. Uh, we love y'all, appreciate your support, and we'll catch you on the next one. See you. Peace out.